on. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, shall we introduce ourselves? I'm Hugo. I'm VP of Design. I'm Tom. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO here. I'm delighted to see you all uh, on such a warm, sunny day. You choose to come and take refuge in the air-conditioned office of Monzo. <laughs> but it's amazing to see so many people here and also on the stream and in various locations around the country. So we've got about half an hour now. Uh, we're doing an Ask Me Anything, which will be exciting. I think we have about 10 or 12 questions lined up. And we'll try and whiz through those. And if we manage to do so, we'll take questions from all of you here. I think we have a roving mic around. Um, so without further ado, let's dive in. Let's do it. Let's see. Boom. I think this one is for you. At yeah. what point, let's read them because, um, okay. at what point did you think, uh, you know what, I'm going to start a bank. Um, what, was, uh, what happened to you, basically? <laughs> is there a story <laughs> to be told? Yeah. Um, so I, before Monzo, I, um, with two other um, guys from university, I started a company called Go Cardless, which was, uh, or at least became a payment processor, a direct debit payment processor, collecting recurring payments for small, medium, and now very large businesses. And it was really, really interesting for a number of reasons, but I wasn't very, very passionate about direct debit processing for small and medium businesses, businesses as, as strange as that sounds. Um, and I really wanted to do something that, uh, that kind of impacted, or, you know, that I cared about on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. And a bank account was something that I had to use and all my friends and family had to use, and they uniformly sucked. Um, and doing this sort of go cardless experience taught me that if you start from scratch and build your own technology, you can kind of unravel a lot of the layers of crap that goes around banking. I, I like everyone, I think, had just assumed that banking, especially my banking app, was complicated and clunky because banking itself had to be comp complicated and clunky. And actually building a card has taught me that it's just not really true. Payments move around and basically entries in a ledger and there's no reason they can't be instantaneous. They can't come with um, sort of all of the data around it that makes sense to you rather than a kind of garbled string of, of numbers and letters. And so I really wanted to do something that my friends and family could use and, and worked a lot more like WhatsApp or uh, Spotify than NatWest. Um, so yeah, that, that was it really. And um, Thrive, who, who led our series, C. I was in New York uh, working with Jonas on a dating website before Monzo. And um, I remember very clearly sitting down with one of the partners at Thrive as this sort of dating website was winding up. And he said, what do you want to do next? And I said, I, you know, I, I really think I want to start a bank. And he sort of looked at me slightly incredulously, but sort of shrugged and went, sounds pretty cool. If you ever do start a bank, come back and, and we'd love to invest. And then two or three years later, I did, and, and they did, and the rest is history. Let's go to the next. Um has your decision-making process or hours, I guess, uh, changed as the company has grown? Um, and if we are more risk-averse based on the number of Why did you say this? Um, I think we are, and I think that's good. So from, from, a point of view of, from a point of view of design, the kind of things we do, we try to play them a bit safer. Um, also, we are very cautious on doing things that maybe they start for, like we, we roll them out for a small number of customers, and then we, as we get confident that it's the right thing, we, we increase. So we're more diligent with that, and I think it's good. Um, at a deep, deeper sense of how we are willing to do things in a better way, I think it's the same. We haven't seen change on actually trying to f really fix the problem and not play it safe at a kind of like conceptual level. So it's more maybe in the operations, in how we do it. Like I think we are more, more professional, to be honest. Yeah, one of the... Uh, Jonas and I both love talking in metaphors, um, and they get very tiresome, I think, if you're... If you have to hear them over and over again. This is probably the first time you've heard it, so I'm going to roll out one of my metaphors. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> you know which one's coming. Um, so I think the, the, my current favorite metaphor is, is a Formula One car and a, the pit stop of a Formula One car. And if you've ever seen um, these either on TV or in, in person, it's amazing that you've got this incredible well-honed machine that comes in and you've got a team of 20 or 30 people and more behind the scenes, all trained to do a pit stop, replace tires, refuel in under three seconds, and you're out, you're racing again. And it's just an unbelievable team effort. And the amount of precision and control that goes into creating this incredibly fast-moving vehicle is unbelievable. Sticking with motorsports, you, you may also have seen drag racing. 
Which is basically you get a go-kart and strap a rocket to the back of it and press go, and it just goes... And the problem with running a drag racing car is if you come to a corner, you're fucked, basically. The whole thing just, like, erupts in a ball of fire. Um, because there's not a huge amount... They go really, really fast until they hit a corner or a speed bump or they have to change direction. And then I think you find out then you're not in control. And so for Monza, I don't want to slow down, but I want to go fast in the Formula One sense. Absolutely in control and precision engineering. Everyone drilled, who knows, you know, everyone knows exactly what they need to do at every point in time to get the, the pit stop under three seconds. Not the going fast of like lighting a match on the bloody rocket strapped to a go-kart. Because you end up making huge, huge mistakes. And at our scale, when we're looking after people's life savings, terrible stuff happens. So um, I think we have changed our approach slightly. Um, but I, I don't think it necessarily means we have to go too much slower. Great metaphor. Never heard it before. <laughs> um, excellent. Um, what, do, what, what does a VP look like uh, as a role? And what way is it different to, to other seniors? I can give my point of view on this. Um, so I think about it like um, Dean Nash, one of our executives, he told me something like, I, I was promoted to VP um, a few months ago, and he came to say something like, from this point on, you are not a designer in a, in, in like, I don't know how to say, like the most expert designer in the company, but you are an, like a leader with a design background. That's how I try to think about it. Um, so it's about kind of trying to think on the things that are more impactful at a company level, at a business level, so to try to do the better for our customers and, and our investors in a way that is not necessarily through a design lens constantly, but to, to actually be a bit wider. Um, so I think that's a bit of that. Also a lot about, I guess, kind of like trying to set the tone of like what great looks like or how to conduct ourselves, all that. Like I think I take it maybe, maybe a bit more seriously than before because maybe some people look up to me and my team and all that stuff. So yeah, that's how I think about it. How, how do you think about this? Yeah, so the background here is we have um, sort of C-level executives who form our executive committee. There are about approximately 10 of us. Um, and then the, the rung below that are our VPs, and we have five or six at the moment. We're bolstering that, that kind of rank. And then the rank below that it, we call directors, basically. And I, I agree with Hugo. The move from... So our directors really are the people who you can give entire problems to, and they will own it end-to-end -end and are like really responsible for the delivery of the solution to that problem, to run the team, um, and to deliver that over weeks or months or even six months. Kind of a really chunky project to actually, I think they're the kind of the leaders day to day who are kind of delivering projects. VPs for me are just a little bit more, uh, operate at a kind of more meta level of abstraction. They're looking at the organization, looking at the structures and the people and the ways of working and the tools and the processes to make sure that the, the people who are kind of actually delivering the work are sort of fully able to do so. They have the right tools, they're unblocked, they're kind of pointed in the, in the right direction. So it's, a, it's an interesting mindset, mindset shift to go from someone who's like doing, 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 delivering, really responsible for, fully responsible for delivery of the thing every day to someone who's just a little bit more abstract, looking at kind of, looking at the organization, the machine that then builds the end Monzo product. Does that make sense? This one is for me. Um, go away. Um, it says, <laughs> uh, how much input I, I still have on, on the actual design of the product and if I'm hands on and if it's a part of, of my job. So it depends. I think I, I, I'm not. Like, I kind of design through uh, spreadsheets kind of thing, right? Like, my, my job is more like talking with people, communication, and keeping people productive and happy. Um, I sometimes get involved when, when I have more context just because I've been here longer. So Great. I've been here since day one. Um, so particularly things that are structural in the app. So some of the changes that uh, Beth um, and Bruno were showing before, um, I get involved on that because I, I think it's, it's I, I can add some value. And the same with our cards. So all these um, like Monso Plus cards, stuff like that, I get involved. Um, but I'm not usually actually designing things. Um, our design team is way, way better than, than I was as a designer. So that, that wouldn't make sense. It's, it's more about maybe in a whiteboard, maybe inspiring someone or kind of unlocking problems, th that kind of stuff. So it's, it's quite cool, actually, because then things happen in parallel. It's, it's super nice. Um, yeah. You don't know what that is. You're not a designer. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat we were talking about the design of the new Monzo business cards. Do you remember this through last week? Um, no, Monzo credit cards. It was Monzo credit cards. Um, this is going to upset you. Um, 
So we'll give the designers three or four weeks and it'll, it'll say Monzo and then next to it in lighter letters it will say credit. And then it was like, ha ha ha, aren't I clever? And then everyone went quiet and I was like, is, is that actually what we've done? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, uh, no, I, honestly, I, design is the skill that I have least, I think, um, of, of all of the different <laughs> skills going into this company. Uh, and so I have huge, huge, huge respect for the designers because I absolutely could not do their job, except for the Monzo credit card, which we're exploring and it's not a, an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Definitely exploring. I guess, um, what will be the next country and after the US? And if the app is built for multiple languages? Um, so 95% of our focus is on the UK. Really 95% of the people, the time, the money, um, and the, the effort is on the UK. 5% right now is the US, and 0% is any other country, being really frank. The choice basically would be either Europe or, or sort of Commonwealth countries, basically, Canada or Australia. Um, and that's not a decision we've made. Um, right now it's, yeah, 95% UK, 5% US. Is the app built for multiple languages? Mm -hmm. uh, I can answer that if you want. So lo localization, it's think, think about it in terms of like multiple languages and multiple currencies. Um, at a design level, it is. Like we've, we've tried to do everything that works like right to left, left to right, different currencies, numbers that are super long. Like all that stuff is covered. The app itself is not built that way, but it, it will be a project. We'll do it. Um, we are doing it in the US. We'll do it in different places as we need to. Doesn't worry me too much. The thing that I think worries me of this is that un actually understanding how the service needs to run in different places. Like, honestly, changing a pound sign here and there, like, that's very easy. The, the tricky bit here is to say, like, direct debits that doesn't exist in other places, right? Like, what's the equivalent? How that works? Um, what, what cycles of uh, money use people use? Do they use cash a lot? Um, how do they get paid? Like, all those things are really the really cool thing. And we are learning that in the US right now. Um, so yeah, the, the technical bit really, I, I think it's gonna be on rails. The way more interesting is the other one, which I hope also will do great, but yeah, it's, it's more uncertain, I guess. Very good. Um, so this question is, um, is it adding more third-party integrations, uh, the way for us to, to uh, da -da -da -da, for us to work, or if we are gonna build things uh, by ourselves and then uh, migrate um, for services and technology? Should I have a shot at this? Please. Um, so I think from a technical infrastructure and payments infrastructure point of view, we have been bringing more and more in-house over the last few years, and we are happier and happier the more we bring in-house, frankly. So you may, may remember two years ago or so, we had a lot of problems with our card processor. When we were on prepaid, we had a, a number of outages that we, weren't, we just weren't happy with, and we weren't really in control of, honestly. And so we rebuilt that MasterCard processor in-house, got it certified, and now, touch wood, it's, it's extremely stable and, and resilient and high performing. We had an outage about two or three weeks ago when faster payments for a, a proportion of faster payments for about eight hours were delayed or rejected. Again, a very similar thing happened that the, a third party piece of software that sat between us and the payment scheme um, basically took an outage. Um, and we made the commitment to, to rebuild that piece of software in-house and again, get it recertified. And we hope, we hope it'll be more resilient, but in any case, we'll have more control of it, which uh, I think makes us more comfortable. So from a technical and payments infrastructure perspective, more and more in-house, and as we go around the world, that, that will remain the same. Um, from a product and kind of customer point of view, we've talked a lot about um, Monzo being a kind of hub into which you plug all of the spokes that kind of, that, that are your financial life. And we've been relatively slow on that, honestly. I think the best example is savings accounts. So we now have, uh, two or three and soon soon more are coming providers offering good interest rates much better than you get at on the high street banks and as we go kind of vertical by vertical whether it's insurance or investments or mortgage switching i think we need to make a decision whether in that particular vertical it makes sense for us to either do it ourselves to choose a single kind of best in class provider as we've done with um, foreign transfers we use transferwise or whether it's useful to have a broad range of providers um, so for stuff like uh, Insure, car insurance, different providers target different population niches, and actually it's quite useful to have um, a number of different insurance providers so that each of our customer segments can get a great deal, whether you're a 19-year-old young man or a 63-year-old woman. You tend to get 
different pricing from different providers. And so plugging in a number actually is, is pretty useful. So on that kind of marketplace approach, I think we do need to take it vertical by vertical and see what makes sense. Okay. Mm, what's the one thing that we miss from those days when we were 50 people staff? Um, now we are about a thousand to put in perspective. What do you miss? I actually read your answer, and I <laughs> it's just really small we, letters. We have, we have speaker notes, but they're like smaller than <laughs> like one pixel. Font okay. size four. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, you steal it? What do I miss? I, I, no, I won't steal it. Um, you go that. OK, so what I miss, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's getting bigger. Oh, oh excellent. Thank you. Um, got bigger. So knowing everybody's names, this is so like this is the largest company I've ever worked at. Um, and it's the first place where I work in a place that I don't know everybody. So there's something really, like, it's weird because the way we hire, we, we care a lot about um, our values. So t people are typically, like, very similar in terms of how nice they are. So it's, it's like a monster person, but you don't know their name. It's a bit weird. Um, and then having lunch pretty much every day together, everybody, and having socials. So we do socials from time to time. Um, and we could, when we were less than, than 50 or when we were, like, 20 or 15 people, we'll go to a, to a restaurant all together. That doesn't exist anymore, right? And it's like, oh, I miss it a bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah, communication uh, for me, I think it's an extension of that. If you're all sitting around a table or in a, in a single room, um, getting everyone on the same page and then pointing in the same direction, mixing my metaphors there, um, is very natural. You sort of achieve this mind meld almost when you're kind of 15 or 20 people quite easily. You cross 100 and, and communication has to become much more deliberate. You get to 1,000 and you have to sort of structure organization in certain ways and then even and we call those collectives so we have 10 different collectives within each of those collectives some are more than 100 people and so again you're having to be deliberate about communication even within that collective and then cross-company communication comes even harder and so you just have to think really really hard about um the the processes the kind of rituals the tools you use to get everyone on the same page um because it, if someone like hugo or myself feel like we've said it 50 times we probably have said it 50 times, but the person hearing it might be hearing it only for the first or second time. And so it, that is quite an unnatural feeling, but that's uh, what I miss. Oh, these are questions from, from each other to, to design. Uh, I wish I had design. Yeah, you've, you've, and also, you cannot use that. You've if I, could, I, I wish I could sing or dance, <laughs> ideally both, and I can do neither. Um, it's, yeah, it's like part of my brain has been removed. Okay. Would you let us be the judge? So, no, <laughs> <laughs> Do you love this question? Yeah, so the question is, in, in case someone is watching it and they cannot see the image, it says, uh, where did Hot Coral, the color of her cards, came from? And what's the real story? So, so Hugo always wears an item of clothing that is Hot Coral. <laughs> <laughs> this is not Hot Coral, this is Salmon. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you know how <laughs> this is why I'm not a designer. <laughs> so... Uh, Tom tells this story of that they had some trainers that were hot color. That's bullshit. Like, what color were they? <laughs> okay, forget about that story. <laughs> um, how this actual thing happened. Um, have, have you seen... It, it was a mix of many things. So the hot color cards, this thing that they look so bright, um, it's because it's a very special ink, okay, that reflects ultraviolet light and whatnot. Um, that on its own um, is not common, or it wasn't that common, and it wasn't that obvious that you could have that on a, on a credit card, or in a banking card. So when, when we started um, Monzo at the beginning, we had the prepaid. Well, we were Mondo. We had the prepaid, and we were looking at catalogs of the kind of stuff you could do in plastic cards. Um, banking cards, now they are way better, and I think we've helped on that. They, they used to be quite tacky, like, the, you know, like this kind of imagery that they would have and all that. So most of the options were like that. Um, but in gift cards, people were doing better stuff, particularly um, fashion, fashion stores. So... This was Debenhams. I think Debenhams had a, a range of neon colors, and our provider had had them. And it's like, oh, actually, you can do this. Um, they didn't have hot coral, but they had like some pink, and that connected with something I had done in the past. And we said, okay, this could be a good idea. The idea behind um, was a bit like, have you seen like prototypes of cars when they have them on on the street, but they are not road legal yet? They usually have like very very flashy colors, because the idea is at the beginning. It was a pizza, or it was an alpha. So that design wasn't meant to, to stay, in all honesty. It was a, like a one-off thing to say, OK, look, we want something that people, every time they use it, or people will ask them about, and they have now an opportunity to say, oh, is this thing I'm trying, blah, blah, blah. It breaks a lot, but it seems to be cool. Um, 
And then it turns out people really liked it, you really liked it, and we just stick to it. Um, so yeah, that's a real story. But journalists don't like that one that much. So <laughs> Tom tells the other one, it's more like, oh, it was this crazy thing just happened. And yeah, and it was Hugo's shoes yeah, were hot coral. Exactly. And he had a deadline and said, I'm going to make it. I'll do that. Whatever. I guess I'll do that. Yeah. OK, next question. <laughs> There's no more questions, I think. I just clicked. Is that it? OK, great. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, 10 more minutes, so we will take questions from the audience. There are two roving mics. Oh, how cool. Go back to me first okay um you talked a little bit, bit about values you expect from the people you hire what are they uh this is like an exam question that i'm definitely going to get wrong so i'll talk about in the abstract about them, unless you've memorized all i do but no go on, go on. <laughs> uh why don't you start then okay so we have at least we've it's interesting like we've defined them uh, a few months ago but i think about it like we've written them down like the values were already there um, as a company, we were already doing it, but now we have nice wording that hopefully people can remember. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so one, one of them is um, default to transparency. So, and I think with, with you, it's the same. Like, every time we create a piece of information, it is transparent by default, and, unless we have a very good reason to, to not make it transparent. Um, and that works very well. It simplifies so many things. Like, communication is easier, everything is available. So, so I think one. that is very different. Uh, uh, it's very natural for us, but especially senior people who come, from, come in from big organizations. That's the one thing that they really remarked. Like, oh, you said you were transparent, but oh my gosh, how, like, I didn't realize how transparent you actually were in practice and, and then what knock-on effects that has, good and bad. Um, I, so I think that is, you, as a company, you can write stuff on the wall, but in, unless it's really lived, I don't think it's uh, particularly useful. There you go. Another one is to be hard on problems and not on people. Um, this is something I practice a lot. So. We do design critique, um, and it's one of the things that I, I'm, I'm really hardcore in how I think about design, and I'm tough about design, but not about the designers that have worked on it. So that applies all across the company. So it's, we really want to do something better, um, but we want, we want it with, with people that, that are happy and empowered to be working on those problems, if that makes sense. Um, another one, I'm gonna fuck it up now. Um, another one is um, to um, start small, but think B, and to own problems. So is this, it's maybe similar to what we were saying before, like we are very iterative on the stuff that um, um, Jordan and Fu were, were talking before. So start with small things, but with a, a goal that is really, really important and that actually solves the thing and to enable people to take ownership of the pieces of work. Um, so, so nothing is kind of responsibility of other people. It's, if you are working on it, it is your responsibility to deliver something that's of very good quality and works. Um, so that's another one. Um, pa -pa 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 -pa. We have one that maybe is a bit more aspirational, that is to, make everybody feel that they belong. Um, I think that has a lot to do with um, inclusivity and diversity. So it's something that it's close to our hearts, but we know we have to do way, way better. Um, so that's in there as well. Um, am I missing one? Make, make a difference. Isn't it part of the start small? No, make a difference, okay. To me, it's kind of the same, all right. Make a difference, okay. <laughs> so that's another one. So it's like, well, all right. Is there another one? We were debating adding move fast, um, in control, but I don't think that's been formally added yet. The sort of the racing car analogy, a, a nod to our risk management culture. I, I think that's all of them. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, those are the values. Really, the, the the important thing is maybe what Tom was saying before. Like as we grow, those things we need to document them better because we need to be able to communicate and offices in pl different places in the world, like all those things. More questions? Yeah, I was wondering about your decision to move into the States, particularly, it seems like a kind of strange time, particularly if you're putting kind of 5% of your effort into that. Was that based on the, uh, was that because of the investors? Quite often companies do that because investors don't take them no. seriously enough until they're in the States. Or what was the decision to, to move now and to, to move kind of slowly with only 5% of your effort? Start small, think big. I mean, that's, that's why. Um, there's a really, really long, there are two things, long lead times, basically. Um, we've been working with the regulators in the US for some time now, and that's ongoing. And then also making sure we have product market fit before we're ready to scale. So it's an absolute reflection of that value that I think there's a huge, huge opportunity in the US, 300 million people and their banks more or less suck in the same way that the UK banks do. But we tend not to do big bang launches because they go bang in a bad way. And so we want to start with exactly the same way we started in the UK, which is in-person card handouts. 
hearing from people like you, but with a different accent probably, um, and talking about their bank and getting a card out into their hands so that we can see if it works or not, and figuring out the areas it works really well versus the areas it doesn't work really well, and then iterate to improve it. And so I think you can do that really, really effectively with a team of, of 10 or 15 people. It's exactly the way we started here. I think if we were just presumed the product and service we had in the UK was going to work in the US and, and tr transplanted it without, without um, adapting it, and then you just throw ad budget at it, I think you, it's just super risky. So it's, an, it's our way of, of starting small. Any other questions? So uh, you were talking a lot like today, other people about uh, integration with the partners and other providers. And do you like think about uh, like people feeling like under surveillance or just like you know stalked during the like you are getting offers for because you bought this, then you get the offer for this, and you know like not end up like Google suggesting you some things, then you feel it's like not real for you. You don't want it. I have some thoughts about that. Probably yours are, are, are deeper. The way I think about this, I, the concern is spot on. Like people's privacy matters a lot. Um, I think the thing is to give people the choice in all this stuff. Like to say, hey, are you all right with us sharing these three particular things so you get these other things? Do you want it or not? Like to make it very, very clear. I think what many tech companies have not done very well is to not be clear at all about that and basically hide it as for this to run, you need to do that. We won't tell you about, even though you will read it on the news. I think that's the mistake on its own. Um, to try to lock down privacy, I think it's another process, that it's another way of doing it, that it's all right, but it doesn't necessarily un like allow for many of the things that you can, if you are in control of your own data and you share it the way you want. Um, does, that, does that make sense? That's how I think about it. I, don't know how you think. I agree, I think it's about user choice. I think just saying we're not gonna do any of them because some proportion of people won't like it is I think really bad for most people. But the other extreme, which is we'll share all of your data with loads of people without asking you, I think gets you in a huge amount of trouble, as we've seen with some of the big tech companies. So giving people visibility and control, um, I think the, the, da the evidence we've seen so far is that vast majority of people are very, very happy to share a small amount of data in return for saving 300 quid on their gas and electricity, for example. The kind of convenience and ease of use is worth that trade-off, but it it has to be an explicit choice from the customer, not a sort of buried kind of 10 menus deep. Um, I, was, I was wondering what's your approach to, right here in the back. <laughs> it's um, so difficult to try. <laughs> um, what's your approach to lending, uh, particularly to risk and credit assessment? I think in your annual report you said you lent out 90 million pounds in overdraft to, in 2019. You're also planning to lose um, 3 million of that. So I think that's a very quick way how to lose a lot of money. So I'm just wondering what's, what's your approach to um, is that like an experiment you're running, or what's your approach to to lending? Um, right now, our approach um, what is our approach to lending. I think we've been slow. Basically, uh, we have something like two point three million customers now, about six hundred million pounds of deposits, and we know those customers are borrowing about seven point five billion pounds of unsecured borrowing, that's excluding mortgages and student debt. Uh, that's just unsecured things like credit cards, um, lines of credit overdrafts, term loans. So 2.3 million uh, customers are borrowing 7.5 billion pounds. We are currently servicing uh, about 36 million pounds of that 7.5 billion pounds of borrowing. Um, and we know people aren't often paying the best rates and that the service they're getting isn't always the best either. And so we think there's a huge opportunity to give our customers a product that they are already using elsewhere and get them really competitive rates and provide them a much, much, much better experience in terms of transparency, flexibility, ease of use, pe like no penalty fares, whilst also making Monzo sustainable. Um, and honestly, we've just not been very good at scaling that lending book. Um, our default rates right now are running between about two and three and a half percent, which is absolutely fine. Right? When you lend money out, you take some credit risk and you expect some proportion like to lose some proportion, and that's okay. Uh, if you're not losing any money, you're probably not lending to enough people. Um, and so it's something we need to scale out. I think we can, um, over the next few years, with the access to the data we have, maybe what you're spending, where you're spending it, your salary, those kind of things, we can build credit models that are industry leading. Right now, we're not. We're using credit reference data, basically, from there are three big um, credit reference agencies, Experian, 
and a couple of others. And we basically get your credit file and make an assessment on that. It's pretty dumb. If you're new to the country, you don't appear. If you move around a lot, you don't appear. If you've never borrowed before, very, very thin files. And we can't lend to any of you based on that. So I think we can do a lot better for customers uh, and also help make Monster sustainable. So that's going to be our approach. And you'll probably see the lending book scale um, quite nicely, I hope, over the next six or nine months. So 35 million pounds today. We're aiming to be yeah, sort of 150, 200 million pound loan book in the next six or nine months or so. Uh, we have one time for one last question, I think. The, the box. That guy has been waiting for a long time. Thank you. So this is a, a two-parter. It's about um, your marketplace um, statement you made. Uh, first of all, why do you think you've been slow in terms of building that out? And secondly, um, I know in America, there's a company called SoFi who are like pioneering this subscription-based um, financial services model. So what are your thoughts on that? And would you ever adopt that? I probably don't have enough context. Uh, marketplace, why I've been slow. Uh... Why have we been slow? Um, to start with, the current account wasn't ready last year. There was just a bunch of missing functionality. And even, and I think we fixed a lot of that in 2018. Even now, I think the main, um, we need to drive deeper adoption engagement of the Monzo product. And that's encouraging more people to put their salaries in. So please put your salaries in and set their direct debits up out of Monzo. Because that then gives you the data, which makes it really easy for you to say, hey, British Gas just hiked your prices up from X to Y you will absolutely get a better deal if you switch to Octopus or Bulb or whoever. We don't have that direct debit data for most of the customers now. Um, and so I think it makes sense for us to drive engagement of salaries and direct debits. And in parallel, be working on the kind of partnerships like mortgage switching and energy switching so that when we do have that really deep engagement and visibility of data, uh, then we're able to offer this kind of super convenient marketplace. But we're not there right now. So Please, please, please put your salary in. Um, the second question, uh, subscription, basically <coughs> subscription-based business models. Yeah, I mean, that's something we're looking at with Monzo Plus for sure. Um, so Monzo Plus will have a, a monthly subscription with then optional bolt-ons. You know, if you're someone who travels a lot, you can, in future, or even today, you'll get travel insurance, but e extras that will make traveling better, whether it's lounge access or whatever. Or if you are a renter, getting rental co like content insurance, for example. So kind of bolt-ons that suit your lifestyle for a monthly subscription absolutely is one way we're exploring of, uh, of monetizing. Some great questions, and thank you again. I think we're all out of time. Um, I'm going to run to the next building for a keynote in approximately 20 or 30 minutes, I think. Um, so it's absolutely wonderful seeing you all here. Thank you very much for giving up your sunny Saturday to come listen to us talk about banking. And thank you again for all of your support in the, in the crowdfunding. It's, it means an absolute huge deal to all of us. So thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.